But today we're going to be talking about vCloud Director and Rubric. Okay. Do you want me to talk a little bit louder? I can talk louder. Start yelling if we have to. Yeah. I was trying to be quiet, but I can be loud. <laughs> Um, so hello, my name is Rebecca Fitzhugh. Um, I am actually the Director of API Strategy, Open Source, and Developer Relations at Rubrik. Very long title, so I made it as short as possible on the slide. Uh, but before I got into all the fun engineering stuff that I do today, I actually began as a consultant um, in specializing on VMware products, and I've been f lucky enough to work on vCloud Director since 1.0, and I am uh, a VMware Certified Design Expert. And here's all the ways that you can get in contact with me or harass me after the session. Okay, I'm Raf Poltronieri. I'm a Cloud Solution Architect at uh, Cloud Italia Telecomunicazioni. Um, some certifications, the, most, the, the, the one that I'm most proud of is the Barbecue Master, but it doesn't <laughs> make with, with the IT. Anyway, uh, you can find me on Twitter with handle at Rafapol, and I have a blog if you have the time to look at it, it's uh, uh, viaddicted.wordpress.com. Okay, uh, so this is the agenda. Uh, I won't bother you, you just can have a look, but maybe it's more interesting uh, when we will uh, explain it. So, um, well, so uh, as I told before, we are a cloud service provider, and as a service provider, we usually uh, have to uh, manage some several challenges with the uh, customers. Customers are nice. Uh, we love customers, but uh, we love them a little less when they ask something uh, out of standards. You know, when <laughs> they open tickets, they are uh, asking for support for something that is out of standards. As I told, they are uh, overlapping. You know, uh, networks, uh, private networks. So uh, we had to go manually and uh, uh, solve uh, problems. So um, automation will be a very good start for for us. Um, I can, 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 can go ahead. Yeah, sure. Okay. So. <laughs> When it comes to designing any kind of solution for vCloud Director, it's very challenging because as Raf mentioned, you have these highly specific customers and you have to kind of tailor to each customer's needs, overlapping networks, and so on, right? So it's, it's very much a challenge. And so with Rubrik, you know, we took a lot of thought into how we were going to protect vCloud Director and, and vApps. Um, so one of the main things, and obviously one of the main tenants, uh, I guess pun intended here, when it comes to being a service provider is you need multi-tenancy. You need role-based access control, right? You need to make sure that that customer is only accessing and protecting their data and their workloads. So we've taken a kind of a logical separation approach with Rubrik. Could you design two separate physical clusters and protect two different customers? Absolutely. And that would make our sales team very happy because that means you're buying more Rubrik software. But realistically, that's probably not what you want to do, right? So you have the ability to provision and create separate organizations within the same cluster and to limit that access and to really specify at a granular level what those organizations and users should be able to do. Which, for example, SLA domains should they have access to? Who should even have access in terms of the user? Um, which workloads and so on? So from the context of a service provider, this makes it very easy for you to provide that granular access and control to your different tenants. But, and this is where I'm going to stop talking about service providers for one second, we actually sometimes have our customers use our organizations for other ways. For example, they might create an organization and have it um, add only SQL databases. Right? and only certain SLA domains, and then give access only to those DBAs. So that way the DBAs don't get in and access or see anything else. And they're still using the same organization model as a service provider, but for a completely different use case. So there's a lot of flexibility here in how you do this. Self-service. <laughs> The very kind of first slide was the picture of the service provider kind of trying to push this rock up a mountain, right, the boulder up the mountain. It can be very challenging. And for, for me, I can honestly say this is where we have Raf here. I've never worked for a service provider. I've done consulting for service providers, and it was challenging even from the consulting perspective because there's so many tickets coming in, there's so many requests, there's so much. And the thing that you want to do as a service provider and the thing the customer ultimately wants is to just sometimes do it themselves. 
So we have a self-service model, and there's a number of ways that you could do this. We'll talk about Envoy in a second, but one of the things that we announced earlier this year was a plugin for vCloud Director. So you can actually go and protect, manage your workloads with Rubrik without ever leaving the vCloud Director console, and I will show that shortly. So that's definitely one very easy model. The other option is Envoy. So Envoy is uh, potentially an add-on that you can use to, it, what it was really designed for, if I kind of take a step back, was we have service providers who have workloads that are in and connected to isolated networks. So if the rubric cluster, if I hit next in just a second, is connected to the provider network, and then you have your tenant networks, and then you have an isolated tenant network, how are we going to have that network connectivity between rubric on the provider network and that workload belonging to the tenant that's isolated? That poses a challenge. And so you have Envoy that helps kind of serve that need. And so that allows you to also have this user interface where you can enable self-service for that particular subset of your workloads. So architecturally, it would look something like this, right, where you have your tenant network, and it may be isolated, and then you have a dual-pronged approach with Envoy where it's connecting to this isolated network, but then also has connectivity over to this provider network to solve for that need. Now, this is where any networking person in the room goes, cool, there's other ways around that. Absolutely, there are. And we endorse any way that you want to solve for this problem. You could, for example, have this tenant network and then firewall and then NAT and go through all of these extra complications, if you will, and same, so solve that same problem. This is a completely valid design. This is, in fact, a part of the VMware validated design architecture that you could use. But if you're looking for something potentially a little bit more simple and you want to enable that self-service through Envoy, where you have your customers logging into Envoy rather than the main rubric cluster, you could do that. And then here's where I will take a lot of pride. Um, my team helped co-develop this, and we were very, very proud of it. Um, so you're going to hear me talk very gloriously about it, but please give me actual real feedback on it as well so we can make it better. But we have the ability, like I mentioned before, to install a plugin at the provider level. So you as the provider will go through and install this plugin, and then you will determine the scope of who, which tenants have access to that plugin. Right? And this will allow you to also map that back to the organizations that you've created on the rubric cluster. Right? And so now you can have your customers go in and they can monitor for SLA compliance, they can assign protection, they can take on-demand snaps, and more importantly, they can recover themselves. Right? They can export the VApp or they can do an instant recovery. And I'll get into what all of that means in just a second when I do the demo. This is one of the... <laughs> We were very excited. Um, we're an API first company. You're going to hear me go on and on about APIs later because that's the thing that I'm very passionate about. And so when vCloud Director um, you know, and the vCPP team opened this up in 9.1 and said, yes, you can create your own plugin, we were immediately like, we're going to do that. That is something that our customers want. That's something that they need. And this is something that's been very widely adopted. HTML5. Yes, oh. HTML5, yes, finally, <laughs> well, right? The tenants were really, really glad for this. Oh, yes. providers also. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I accidentally tweeted something. I was like, oh, I'm really excited of looking at this framework. And I immediately got a 1,000 emails from customers that were like, great, do you have a beta? When can I start using this? And we're like, whoa, 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 we just started development last year. So luckily, it's GA. It's been GA for a few months. Yeah. We're very happy with that. And here's where I'm going to brave a live demo. Okay, I say brave a live demo here because I made a rookie mistake today in that I left my dongle for Thunderbolt to Ethernet in my hotel room. So we're going to try this on Wi-Fi. I'm a believer that it's gonna work. If not, we have a plan B. So what I'm gonna go through is, for any of you, I know I see a couple of familiar faces, some customers, but some of you might be new to Rubrik. So we're gonna begin by creating an SLA domain, and then we're going to assign this to a workload and I'm going to show you a little bit about our multi-tenancy, and then we're going to go through a couple of recovery processes, and then I'm going to show you the favorite thing of this demo, which is the plugin, and see how you can allow for that self-service. So if I hit next, we have our SpongeBob reference, and then let's jump in. Okay, so if you have not seen this, this is the lovely Rubrik user interface, HTML5, right, of course. <laughs> <laughs> All joking aside. Um, you know, when you first log in, you just get a lovely summary view of your workloads and of that protection. 
overall. What I want to do to begin with is create an SLA domain. So an SLA domain is that core construct of our platform that allows you to define the frequency of backup, the retention, archival, replication, and so on. Right? And this is what you're going to be able to apply to your workloads in a very declarative manner. Right? So it's pretty flexible in where and how you can assign this, and I will show that. So we see that we, I, just back about one more second, have logged in as an administrator across all organizations. So right now you are seeing the holistic view of all SLA domains here. So I can go through and create this lovely SLA domain. I'm gonna call it vmworld-demo. If I want to, I can toggle on advanced and get very, very granular on specifically which day of the week and when this protection occurs. But for the purpose of this demo, I'm gonna keep it simple. So let's say we want to take a backup every one hour, and I'm gonna keep that for one day. I'm going to back up every one day and keep that for, let's say, three days, and then back up every one month, and then let's hold on to that for 24, right? So two years at this point. Down below, you see that it automatically says your retention is set to two years. Now, by default, that means two years on the rubric cluster, and that's where the next screen comes in. You can also specify your snapshot window of when this protection occurs. So I go over to remote settings, right? By default, we see the retention on the cluster is set to two years by default. I can now go ahead and toggle on archive and then choose one of our many archive locations. So in this environment, you see that we have kind of the run of the mill. We like to play with everything. So we've got Google Cloud, we have AWS, we have Azure, we have NFS on-prem, we have S3 compatible object storage on-prem, and so on. The one thing that we don't have in our lab, but we do support, that I refuse as an architect to put in our lab is tape. But we do support it, right? I just don't have the ability to show you that today. So I go ahead here and I just say, yes, let's go ahead and choose S3 in AWS, and this is specifically in the Oregon region. Now I have the ability to go ahead and toggle back. Do I really want to retain everything on the rubric cluster for two years? Probably not. Again, our sales team would love that. Me personally, that's not the approach I want to take. So let's say that I have it for 45 days on my cluster, and then after that it's going to archive to AWS, and then once that data hits the expiration date of two years from that point in time, then rubric will automatically do garbage collection and right, remove that backup. I can, of course, also replicate. So if I have multiple rubric clusters, I can replicate from you know, A to B, B to A, however I choose, right? So in this case, we'll go ahead and say, let's go, I'm right now logged into cluster B. I wanna replicate to cluster A, and I wanna retain that replicated copy, let's say for 10 days, okay? Oh, you know why? Because I was testing my automation earlier and didn't delete the SLA domain, look at that. There was always going to be a screw up in the, in the <laughs> and that's where it is. So we actually already have one, da, 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 uh, named that. So it already warned me and said, Rebecca, you've already done this today. That's what I get for practicing. I didn't clean up after myself. So if we go to our workloads themselves, our virtual machines, we see all the different types of virtual machines that we do support. In this case, we're going to specifically look at our vCloud Director vApps. So by default, it shows me all of the VCD vApps. Now, Here's the fun part. Once I add my VCD instance to Rubrik, it automatically discovers the hierarchy for me. Same thing, if I add a new vApp, it automatically discovers that. So I can just come in here and protect it. Now, if it doesn't show up, it might not have refreshed yet, you can always force a refresh, right? It, by default, refreshes every 30 minutes. Now, let's go ahead and select, in this case, our WordPress vApp and manage protection. And this is where it's going to allow me, in this particular case, to go ahead and select that VMworld demo SLA domain. Now, this is very granular, right? I've gone down to the vApp construct itself. I might not allow that, right? I might have one SLA domain that I say, guess what, organization, this is it. And I might not want to have to go to each vApp individually and protect it. So what I can do is I can protect that at a higher level within the hierarchy. So right here, for example, I could just come to the VCD instance that we have and say, yeah, protect everything with this one SLA domain, right? And everything within that hierarchy will go ahead and auto-inherit that. 
Now, of course, I can still go down to a more granular object and override it with a different policy if I want to, right? If I click that, it will let me go through and continue to navigate through my hierarchy. So I can see now all of my different organizations. If I select an organization, then I can see the different virtual data centers that are available. And then, of course, I can go into a virtual data center and see all of the different VApps. So again, whatever level that I want to apply protection, I can. Now, I've been showing you this from the point of view of the provider. I'm seeing everything right now. If I go to my settings and look at organizations, this is where I can go through and create that mapping of which organizations within Rubrik and logically segment my Rubrik cluster and then map that back to my VCD, in this case, organizations. So we have several different tenants available. So I'm really going to be messing today with tenant one, or I shouldn't say messing with, but using tenant one today. So I can go through and I can see what is a part of that right now and I can see who has access to that. As you can see, I am not creative at all when it comes to naming. So it's tenant one, and the user's name is tenant one, right? But this could be whatever the customer's name is or whatever identifiers that I'm using. And then I can come through and I can edit this tenant, right, or this organization and specify additional users. I can go through and specify exactly which objects are available to it, right? So back to, for example, that VCD organization. I can also go through and say, what resources? Because again, you as a service provider might say, you have access to AWS, Azure, and so on, but you've only paid for AWS to archive to. So now I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna specify under archival locations, you only have access to this bucket, right? And same thing for SLA domains. Notice I have a wide array of different SLA domains, but I don't have access yet for this tenant to VMworld demo. And that's the one I really want to have access to. So let's go ahead and select that, hit next, and then we're going to go ahead and finish. Now, if I were to log out of the Rebecca account, the master of all things, and log in as tenant one, again, very similar. It's going to look and feel the same, but notice what I don't have access to. I don't have access to all of those reporting metrics that I saw when I logged in, because I don't want that tenant to see that, potentially. Right? So I've limited already just the dashboard itself. And if I go to SLA domains, I don't see that big long list. Right? Again, if we go to vApps, I don't see all of those vApps. I only see the vApps in that organization that I've mapped to. Right? So very granular access. Now, Let's show the thing that we, I care about the most right now, the plugin. All right. So I have now logged in to vCloud Director using tenant one in this case, so not from the provider context, but specifically on this particular tenant. And if I go to, if I go back out, we can see that I have two virtual data centers and I have three vApps specifically in this organization. If I come to the hamburger menu, if you will, and click data protection, Sometimes it likes to think for a second. All right, and then it loads and it shows me all three of those VApps. And so I can, at this point in time, go ahead, select, say, Matt's Brew Pub. This is where we started getting a little too creative for our own good. That's why you know it's like tenant one and then we got creative underneath that. And I can go ahead and say, I wanna take an on-demand snapshot or I want to assign protection. So in this case, I can do that exact same thing that I did in the rubric UI but through vCloud Director. So I can go ahead and say, yes, that VMworld demo, SLA domain, verify that that's exactly what I want in terms of protection, and say done. And then if I want to, I can go ahead now and take an on-demand snapshot. And I can specify a different SLA domain for an on-demand snapshot. So this is actually kind of interesting, at least to me, uh -huh, is that I met with a customer earlier this year and I had never actually thought about doing this and this customer was showing me all of their SLA domains and they went, yeah, you know what we have? We actually have an SLA domain just for maintenance. And I went, well, why, all right? And they started going on this whole thing and they said, well, our retention policy for most things is seven years, but we always take a backup right before we do any kind of upgrades or maintenance, but we don't actually care that much about that backup unless something goes wrong. So I don't really want to retain the on-demand snapshot for seven years. I might only want it for 72 hours. 
So what you can actually do is right now, when I take this on-demand snapshot, I can specify maintenance or whatever SLA domain that I want to call it. And I can take this on-demand snapshot, I can do my upgrade, I can do my work, and then it will automatically purge that protected copy at that period of time, which can be less than your regularly interval, right, or regularly scheduled backups, right, independent of that. So I thought that was really, in my opinion, kind of ingenious. It was a, a little bit of a hack that I was like, I'm doing that in our lab from now on. So I can go ahead and take this on-demand snapshot using the maintenance SLA domain, and then voila. Now. Has anyone used Rubrik before? I, again, I know some customers in here. Are we kind of new, all right, some of us. So I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna export a few vApps. And this is where it's kind of cool, um, in my opinion, because you have the ability to do an instant recovery of a vApp, and what that will do is deprecate the original, right? And then within 60 seconds, very fast, go ahead and spin up that point in time copy for you, right? The entire vApp or subsets of it. And this is where this was a lot of engineering effort for you to be able to go through and choose all the different options, disconnect from the network, choose a different storage policy, and so on. So I can go through, in this case, I don't want to do an instant recovery because I like this VApp. I don't want it to get deprecated. I'm going to export. So this is going to spin up a VApp from that point in time off of that protected copy. So in this case, let's choose Matt's Sushi Emporium and choose export. And this is where it gets a little bit you know, fun. What are you trying to recover here? The entire vApp? Or are you just trying to <coughs> recover one virtual machine? And if you are trying to recover one virtual machine, where do you want to put it? Do you want to create a whole new vApp with this one virtual machine that you're recovering? Or do you want to recover it back into the same vApp? Or even a different existing vApp? A lot of options, right? So in this case, I might say, you know what, new VAP or existing VAP, and then choose that, and then go through that recovery process at a more granular level. In this case, I'm gonna cheat a little bit and say, let's do a full VAP recovery. And then it shows me again. This is all through vCloud Director UI. Well, which point in time? All right, so I can go through and choose which point in time. So let's say October 7th. Next. Now, where do I wanna export it to? And this is where sometimes I'm like, is there such a thing as too many options? Right, Because now I can say, do I want to recover that within the same organization or a different organization? Maybe I want to go through and test something or test some kind of upgrade and export it to a completely different tenant for that. Or maybe I want to make it a template. Right? You can use Rubrik as well to protect your VCD templates. Right? So very nice. So I can go through and say, yep, let's go ahead and do this in the same tenant the same virtual data center, and then do I want to manually power on the vApp, or do I want to deselect that and have it automatically power on? Do I want to map the NICs to an existing network? Do I want to have no mapping? Do I just want to completely delete the NICs and, and reconnect this all manually myself? So if I hit advanced here, this is where it allows me to choose which network do I want to connect it to. All right, so again, just the world is your oyster here. You can choose whatever it is you want. I'm gonna say no mapping, just for simplicity's sake. And then we'll just say, what are we going to call this? VMworld test export. And if I want to, I can go ahead and also create a, a prefix for all of the VMs inside of that vApp as well to know that this is a different copy than the original. And then hit done, right? So same thing, we can also do things like uh, through the rubric UI or of course the vCloud Director plugin, things like file level recovery. Do I want to go ahead and recover a file? Right. Again, I can choose things like hosts, search, and then it'll show me all of the files that match that, and then I can go through it again and choose that same point in time. That's good. Next, and then where do I want to restore that to? Right, Back to the original state and overwrite if it exists, or restore it to a separate folder, and then I'll go ahead and input things like my credentials and go for it. I'm gonna hit use RBS, and then go through that process. Okay, so I have shown you a lot, and I have a lot more to show you. <laughs> so I'm going to pause the demo for a second, and I'm gonna turn it over to Raf so he can talk a little bit about what it's like as a customer. So in case you missed out on anything or you nodded off really quickly, right? we went through created an SLA domain, we applied that to some of our workloads, I went through and showed you some of the organizational type mappings, when we recovered a vApp, right? And then of course, we did a lot of that through the plugin itself. 
Over to you, sir. So, uh, the gods of demos would be nice. <laughs> well, we have one more raft. Please don't, don't jinx me. <laughs> sure. So, uh, the plugin in uh, Bigot Directory is amazing. I mean, um, we have the same functions that uh, the customer can have on a, on a portal of a rubric inside. Uh, Bitcloud director. And this also means that uh, not only that the customer can uh, operate inside the, the, same, uh, the same portal, but also that the customers that doesn't use uh, a rubric as an option, they will find out that nice hamburger menu, <laughs> that, that option. So they find something like that, oh, there's a rubric, why not use it? So it's kind of promotional too. How many cloud providers are in the inside? Good. How many are you using cloud, uh, cloud director? Not the same one. Good. Well, <laughs> Great. I think everybody in the room, right? <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I'm being aware. I'm being aware. <laughs> so um, I would like to present a um, um, customer story. Um, the customer allowed us to, sh to, um, <coughs> to show the, the, what, which, what, which was the story, but he preferred not to, uh, to keep the name. But the point is that. Um, the requirements that we were asking before uh, to Rubrik were uh, the protection of the workload for uh, the customer either in cloud and on-premises. Uh, we wanted a solution that could be uh, as much scalable as possible um, and most of all automatable. Um, we would like, as we are, we are working on cloud, we would like to uh, use all the benefits that cloud give us in uh, order of uh, archival and uh, instantiation of uh, workloads. And then, maybe this is the first part, it's the last part, but I think that's the first, um, allowing the customer to be independent, to, be, um, to, to have the capacity to uh, automate backup, uh, automate uh, tasks uh, regarding uh, everything, uh, all, all backup. Now, a few words about the company I work for. And uh, OK, I work for Cloud Italia Telecomunicazione, is a cloud provider in Italy. <laughs> And uh, uh, today is a part of Iridios. Iridios is a group that uh, merged all, uh, several companies from infrastructure to cloud and, and so on to uh, software house and so on. Uh, today, Iridios is uh, managed by two great funds. Uh, one Italian is uh, F2I, is an infrastructure fund. Another one is a European one, is uh, Margaret's. Now, back to the uh, use case. So. Uh, this is the diagram of the uh, customer. Uh, so the, the workload of this, uh, this customer is uh, the production workload is on uh, in cloud in, uh, in our data centers in uh, organization of the cloud director. Um, backup, uh, what happens? Uh, a backup of the uh, workload, of the production workload, happens in uh, uh, using, of course, in a cluster of rubric. And rubric, um, in a hand, will archive these backups in uh, our uh, NFS storage. And uh, uh, at the same time, it replicates the same workload in uh, uh, on-premises to the customer. The customer has another rubric that keeps the, the uh, replication coming from uh, the cloud and then um, can use it uh, either for disaster recovery or maybe uh, just for testing purposes. It could uh, restore on uh, vCenter. Uh, now, rubric, how did it help us? Um, as a cloud service provider, we, are, uh, we needed multi-tenancy, and we needed a robust one uh, for security uh, for our customer. And most of all, the role-based access control. Um, we needed a solution that could be scalable in a simple way, not to, uh, not we needed so much time to um, open cages to uh, add capacity, you know, just a brick just put it on. We needed more space. We needed more capacity. Just add it in a brick. And this was very big. Um, the self-service that we uh, gave to the tenant, so tenant was uh, independent in, doing, in uh, uh, taking that uh, operation, daily operations. And uh, uh, last one, and this is better uh, Rebecca than me, uh, the uh, exposure of API so that uh, the customer could be uh, autonomous also in automation. 
using uh, simply um, API. Then we, we will show you, uh, or better, she will show you um, simple or, or PowerShell and so on. Um, so which are the terms that are for uh, my point of view, our point of view, uh, most important. Uh, scalability, as I told you before, that before rubric it took uh, also days just to, to uh, um, amplify, to, to uh, enlarge our, our uh, capacity, and now just some hours just to uh, put together some uh, cages and on. Um, the independence that we give to uh, the customer, this is something that customer um, asked us from, well, not, not just this one, but uh, all of them are asking uh, independence just to uh, restore quickly and not opening tickets to, uh, to restore. So most of them uh, are not towards the managed services, but they want to, uh, to manage themselves. Uh, simplicity, of course, because uh, everything is much more simple and not going to open it again, tickets to solve uh, and support. And then again, automation. Automation is um, the key words. Maybe it's the last one again, but maybe it's, it's the key words because uh, it could be uh, with just, just a script, uh, restore an, an environment, or in, even just a simple virtual machine, but uh, most of cases in environments uh, or applications, just with a, with a script. Um, so what we gained from this, the challenges are much more or less what I told before. So the independence of the customer for uh, restoring the, the whole um, workload, um, the uh, possibility to integrate their own API. Maybe they had a uh, um, kind of portal, um, self-made portal. So using that APIs, they could add the restore and backup and uh, tasks for, uh, for their own customers. Um, restore time, where well, Rubrik is, is one of the best one on restore time because there is no time to restore. There is no rehydration of the uh, backup. You just uh, add and uh, mount a disk so you have immediately the, the virtual machine ready. And uh, the possibility also to replicate this workload outside the vCloud director. As uh, told before, the customer has a vCenter. For uh, just uh, uh, testing purposes, just um, replicating the same the same workload in uh, uh, in cloud. Uh, so some numbers. This is just uh, they are not just uh, marketing. They are really uh, tested, and uh, the time to recover for the workload of the customer that dropped down of ninety percent. And so from days to hours. Um, Thirty percent. It, it's it's the real cost that we supported. For, for, sorry for for the the, the the words supported for support. So human cost uh, was reduced, reduced it of thirty uh, percent, and then protection at the same time from um, we call director of the apps and uh, the customer uh, side. That's all. <laughs> See, when we were planning, the, now we're going to finish early, so you can either thank Raf or be upset with Raf because he, he told us when we were doing session planning, he said, I think 15 to 20 <laughs> minutes. That was like eight minutes. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, um, I was amazed by your demo. <laughs> uh, so we're going to kind of go through a very similar process of protecting and recovering a workload, but this time we're going to do it entirely via API um, because that's what I like. Right, um, and so if I hit next, you have a lot of flexibility in what you can do. I mentioned at the beginning that we are an API first platform. So that means that every single click you're making in the UI, everything you're doing is actually calling to the same backend APIs that we use, right? So if you script this, if you use the UI, same set of APIs that are being used, right? So, and if you're a, a, a bit of a sleuth, right, a bit of a detective, and you start really looking through our APIs, and if you get very familiar with your APIs, sometimes you'll see new features in the APIs before in the UI. Just gonna let you know, that little tip. Um, so I mentioned before that you have the ability to uh, protect vCloud Director templates, right? So it's the same SLA domain protection, it's the same export type functionality or instant recover functionality that you would have, right, with the vApp itself. 
So I'm going to walk through um, kind of going using this with PowerShell. So here's where I'm going to ask a little bit of forgiveness. PowerShell is not my first language. It's not even a language that I would say I like. But when I was talking to one of my teammates who's very much a service, he came from a service provider background, um, and he's very big in the VMware community, and we were discussing, and I said, I think I'm gonna do everything with Terraform, or what if I did Python, or what if I did Golang? And he said, please do not go at VMworld and do everything at Golang. <laughs> Um, so I am going to go through it with PowerShell. I think we all know the VMware community loves PowerShell because Kyle Ruddy does 45 sessions every single VMworld on PowerShell. Um, so if I mess up, you know why. PowerShell, not my first language. So we're gonna go through, I'm gonna do a very quick connection to rubric, show you what that looks like. Um, and then I'm going to assign an SLA domain to a vApp, take an on-demand snapshot, and I'm going to export a vApp, okay? Now, I'm going to do this in an interactive mode. So I'm going to, you're gonna see me struggle and type each command individually. This could be scripted, but I figured you probably want to see it kind of step by step and what that would look like. So again, I think obligatory SpongeBob and then HDMI. Okay, so I've switched tenants on you a little bit. So we're in a different tenant um, that we use permanently, right, for our environment. Um, so we just call it our demo tenant. So again, we obviously are not very creative when it comes to naming. Now, I'm connected to the same rubric cluster. What I've done here, very simply, um, is I've done a couple of steps already, and I haven't done anything crazy, and you might not even have to do some of these steps. Unfortunately for me, this is very much a dev laptop, so I have 14 different versions of our PowerShell module at any given time. Um, and I was really excited a couple of weeks ago, because one of my colleagues said, the same colleague who's service provider, loves VCD, he goes, I'm gonna write a bunch of functions in PowerShell for vCloud Director. And I said, great. And then about a week later, he said, can you code review this? And I said, no problem. I'll do that on Friday. And then I opened up the pull request that he had submitted, and it was 4,000 lines of code. And I said, this might take me more than Friday. Um, so we've gone through this very rigorously, um, and, and we have a bit of functionality and we're adding more as we speak. So all I've done in this case, because I have so many different versions of PowerShell and the SDK on my laptop, is go to the specific version, right, change directory there, and then force import this one. Again, because I run multiple versions. You may not have to force import anything. Now, the next thing I need to do is just connect a rubric, right, so very simple command like here, specify which server, and then username, and then I'm gonna go ahead and just show you guys all my password, just kidding. So I'm going to leave my password out here and then type it interactively. Hopefully I typed my password correctly, did not. There we go. You were too fast. Oh my goodness, why? I knew this was gonna happen. We have one demo that's perfect, that means the next demo is not gonna ever be perfect. So let's try one more time a force import. And then if not, we can cheat. And I can show you a video of me doing it this morning when it did decide to work. If we cheat one more time, no, I'll just go to the video. I won't waste your time while I troubleshoot. <sighs> That's because I was, so. I know. I wasn't late. You, it's your fault, yeah. It's my fault, he, he gave yeah. me a compliment. He was like, oh, look at that. The demo gods are with you today. And yeah. then, not so much. So the problem with Never the video say is. Never before demo. Never say before demo is indeed. So the problem with the video is it's, the, the font might not be quite as large as I was able to make it interactively. So now you're going to see me actually successfully authenticate with our rubric cluster. You can see me typing very slow, because PowerShell, I always get very nervous with PowerShell. Now you see why, because it just didn't work today. Look at that, I can type my password correctly this time. Voila, now I'm gonna keep kind of pausing the video so I can talk through it a little bit. So one of the things that you notice here is, of course, what version of cluster that I'm running. So again, I apologize for the small font here, but this specific version is 5.0, right? So I'm running 5.0. I can see my user 
GUID, right, or UUID. If I ever needed to reference my user via API at any point in time, I can grab that information right there. I can see the IP address, and I can also see, very importantly, if I have multiple clusters, what this cluster UUID is, right? So quite a bit of information there. Now, in this case, I have done basic authentication because I've chosen username and password. I could also take that password, use Base64 encoding, and still have basic authentication, or I can generate an API token, right? And I can use an API token issued to me. So lots of authentication options depending on your specific use case. Next thing that I'm going to do here, and here's where you get to see an unedited video. You get to see my best friend send me a WhatsApp message right in the middle of it. So get ready, it's gonna be fun. All right, if I pause it again, I have gone ahead and said, get rubric VCD status connected. Right, so show me all of the VCD instances that are connected to this rubric cluster. And this returned one in this case. I have one instance, and it's called VCD01. I can see what, again, that cluster ID is. I can see the connection status, which we already know is connected because I specified that here as my variable. And I can see what username I'm using between rubric and VCD for authentication. Right. So nothing too crazy, so I know which VCD instance I'm working with. If I have multiple, then I can go ahead and specify what VCD instance I want to use moving forward. Now I'm going to specify git vapp, which vapp I want to, and then I'm gonna pause it here for a second. Primary cluster ID local. Again, this may be a switch that you need to use or not. For our environment, we have multiple rubric clusters and we replicate our workloads from one cluster to another. And we're even super crazy because we really like to experiment. So sometimes we will double protect objects. I will have cluster A be running an old version of code, cluster C running bleeding edge code that you don't have access to yet, and then we always have cluster B running our production generally available code, right? So that's what I'm using right now. Because I now have potentially vCloud Director added to all of these different clusters and replicating and potentially replicating that workload all over the place, I want to specify that the vApp called demo len, right, for Linux, needs to be located and protected and managed by this specific local cluster. So in this case, the one that I connected to at the very beginning, right, not any other cluster or instance of it. Again, if you don't have a crazy complex architecture, you may not need to specify that. And then I've piped here, so I want to do a couple of things at once. I want to go ahead and protect it with an SLA. So I'm going to say go ahead and protect it, SLA, and then which SLA domain that I want to. So here's where you see the SLA domain that I created this morning, forgot to delete, and you got to see that error earlier. So it goes ahead and returns, lets me know right, that a, that SLA is not paused, right? That's something that we introduced as a new function, uh, Ality in 5.1, was the ability to pause an SLA. Say, stop protecting everything right now because I'm about to upgrade rubric, for example, right? Or I'm about to do some sort of failover testing. Right? Whatever your scenario is, you have the ability to pause and then, of course, unpause your SLA domain. Now, I also see information returned back to what is my object name, what is the UUID of this particular object, and what SLA domain is now assigned effectively, right? So on that granular VApp level. So we go ahead and see that it does return, in this case, VMworld demo, which is exactly what I want, right? That's what I just assigned it to. So nothing crazy. One line here, and I've gone ahead and found that SLA, or excuse me, found that VApp and protected it. Now, I'm going to pop over just to verify. Some people like the UI and prefer to click through. I can go to my VMworld demo. And if I go over to VCD vApps, I can see that we have protected it. Right? So nothing too crazy. And here's where I made a mistake. I was planning to edit this video, and then I went, nah, you know what? my live demo will work. <laughs> so that's where I was mentioning you're gonna get to see a fun text message because I was a bad video recorder and forgot to say do not disturb. So get rubric vapp in this case again, demo lin, 
And what we're gonna do here is we're actually going to take an on-demand snapshot. So again, same construct where I need to specify my local cluster, pipe it, and then now we're going to say new snapshot, okay? Now, you can of course specify, yep, use the same SLA domain that's already um, applied to it. But like we talked about before, you have the ability to specify retention for that on-demand snapshot based off of a different SLA domain, which is what I've done here. I've used our maintenance one. So it goes, what, are you sure you're gonna take an on-demand snap? And I say, yes, because I was very confident. So it tells me, okay, it's queued. And then if I pop over to the UI, you can see that that call was received and it kicks off this on-demand snapshot. Now, I'm actually gonna switch to a different vApp now and let that on-demand snapshot finish. So I'm actually going to say, you know what, and this is where I'm gonna break it down kind of step by step for this process. I'm gonna use our demo vApp number one. And again, same thing, I need to specify a local cluster because of our unique architecture. And I'm gonna pause here. I have now found it using its given name, right? The, the common name, demo-vapp01. Now, when you work with the APIs, it looks for the UUID in that specific format, okay? So in this case, for me to go further and to start doing more granular operations on this specific vApp, depending on the command, it might go, wait, 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 for me to input this into the API, I can't use the common name. I need to use the UUID. So in this case here, I'm going to go and grab the object ID for this specific vApp. So in this case, you can see that it's appended by the type of object, so VCD vApp and then triple colon and then the UUID on top of that. Now, I did not show this in the demo, so I can actually kind of pop over and show you this. If you're not exactly sure what, how or what you wanna do there, you can actually go to and grab that out of the UI, right? So notice right up here in the UI, it appends my hierarchical navigation with, guess what? That same exact identifier, right? So I, this is a different vApp, but actually no, it's the same vApp. So I can see that same exact UUID right here in the URL. So that's a cheat if you wanted to kind of skip this step. But obviously if you are scripting and not doing this in an interactive mode, you would do this as a part of that process. Now, I want to do a recovery. Now, for me to do this via API, I need to know which point in time I'm going to recover from. So I need to go and look at all of the available snapshots to use for recovery. So you can see I'm a copy-paste wizard. I was absolutely not gonna type that out. And I could pause here. If I wanted to scroll up, you might see 150 or however many snapshots I have, right? But it's always gonna show the latest one at the very bottom, right? It's gonna go in uh, chronological order. So in this case, what I need to do here, and it shows me, right? very intelligently, whether it's been indexed or not, right, whether it was successful indexing, I can see whether it's been synchronized, right, for replication, I can see my SLA that's assigned for this snap, um, I can see that in a common name, I can also see that using its UUID, there's a lot of information here, but what I really, really want is the snapshot ID, right, the unique identifier for the snapshot for an API recovery. So I'm going to go through and just copy that ID right here off the bottom. So the next thing that I'm going to do, and this is actually a very, this was a fun one to write the functionality for, for PowerShell, because this is very complex. We saw before with exporting a vApp, how many options there were. Is it a single VM, is it a full vApp? Are you going to power it on or not, right? Or are you going to connect it to a different network or the same network and so on? So in this case, I'm going to say, all right, export which vApp, specify that which snapshot, specify that. And then I'm gonna go through and I'm going to say, where I want to export it to. So, and this is where it's getting hard to kind of see, but it's export mode, and then I want to export to new vApp in this particular case. And then I want to say no mapping, right? So I'm going to map my networks to nothing, or I could remove the NICs, or I could specify a network. And then do I want to power it on? Yes or no, right? So in this case, we said true. And it's gonna say, okay, let me think about that. Yes, now we've queued up that task to happen. And this is where you can pop over, and go to that particular VAP, and you can see that export process.
kick off. All right, so if I scroll down, we give it a second, it says creating the new V app, right? And we see that date timestamp appended. This is where I'm going to fast forward a little bit because I don't think you want to sit here and watch a whole lot of nothing happening. So if we keep watching a whole lot of nothing happening, this is where you start seeing, okay, going, okay, we've got that snapshot, we've gone ahead and serviced this up, we're adding it into the vCloud Director inventory right now, we're gonna configure the networking, right, which is what you see here, which I said no mapping. You can also see that it's adding it to the org, and so on. And this is where I'm gonna keep fast forwarding a little bit. This is the boring kind of part. And then I pop over to vCloud Director, in this case, to that tenant, and I can see that import process happening, right? And so on, right? So we can see that it's going ahead and actually, there we go, there's the text message from my best friend, thanks man. Um, and then, uh, do you like it too? Totally like, thanks boo, <laughs> that's great. Uh, so that's now recorded for all eternity for VM, for VM, VM World 2019. And, and this is where I'm just gonna kind of stop because I don't, I think hopefully you believe me at this point that it works, right? We don't have to sit there and keep watching a lot of nothing happening. Now, if this is interesting to you at all or you're passionate about consuming APIs, you can do this a number of ways. That process that I just showed you, I was using PowerShell, right? So I was using it, leveraging kind of that PowerShell syntax. I could have just done this straight up by binding directly to each API endpoint and doing that myself. If I wanted to, I could even do that through the API Explorer, where I could go and say, yes, let's create that SLA domain, right? Let's get a list of that, and I can do this same thing interactively, but through a bit of a GUI sort of method. All of our API documentation is available, right? So it's on your cluster as well as online, right? And we have a number of integrations available for you. So I went straight to GitHub here, but if you are a PowerShell user and you go, I don't care about GitHub, it's in the PowerShell gallery as well. So you can see all of the different functionality and we have extensive documentation online for each of our software development kits, you know, our PowerShell module, Golang, Python, whatever tool you wanna use, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Tariff, I'm not gonna list all of them, you kind of get the point. Um, and if you wanted to, if you go through and you start using one of our modules, like our PowerShell module, and you say, you know what, I noticed you're actually missing a function. A, tell us, it's not 100% API coverage yet, we're working diligently on all of our integrations. Um, so there's way more in the API that you can do than what's in our PowerShell module today. So you have a couple of options. A, you can just simply go to GitHub and file an issue and say, you're missing this, I want it, here's my use case, and we can code that for you. Or if you go, I would really like to learn how to write a function using PowerShell or whatever language, we accept contributions. So you could go through, write that, submit a pull request, my team will get alerted and we'll go through it and do a bunch of security verification checks. We'll make sure that everything is A, working, there's unit tests and so on, and then eventually we'll actually merge that and you can contribute to any of our open source projects. So if we go just to GitHub, right, you can see all of the different repositories that are available. I'm logged in, so you actually see a lot more. If you were looking, it would be like 75 or 80, but we have a lot of early development things in there, so we, I see about 130. Or you can, of course, go to the pretty web page that's not on GitHub, um, but ultimately does link back, and it's called Rubric Build, right? So this is our open source program for all of our different integrations that are available today that allow us to be open source. That was a very long, again, kind of demo, but, <sighs> If you ever see a session by me, you'll figure out that I hate slides and I'd rather just show you. So hopefully that was okay that I just showed you instead of talking a lot with a bunch of boring slides behind me. Oh, SpongeBob. So unfortunately, the PowerShell gods were just not with me today. So we went through a bit of a video there, um, but it was the same thing I was going to show you regardless. So we went ahead and we verified that VCD connectivity. We looked at our uh, SLA domains that were available when we assigned an SLA domain to an existing uh, V app. We took an on-demand snap and then we went through a recovery process. Now, to kind of sum things up, right, hopefully it was not overload of like 60,000 options, but if it was overload of 60,000 options that you have 
come to kind of see that we, a, we care very passionately about vCloud Director at Rubrik um, and, and our service provider partners, um, but we also realize how unique each customer is. So we want to provide you as much flexibility and as many options as possible so that way you can create those tailored services for your different tenants. So we've gone through this. A bit. Yeah, the point. Oh. The main point. Sorry, is that uh, currently um, tenant uh, we call provider. Sorry, we call director tenant has two uh, choices to to uh, restore a backup. So he can access directly on the rubric interface, uh, but maybe he could be scared if it's uh, not so skilled. And so, because so many stuff, so many things, and it's amazing for me, but maybe a <laughs> normal uh, user it could be not, so he can go ahead and uh, use the plugin. So inside the uh, vCloud director, is has more or less the same functions, but they are slower, <laughs> you know? So they can restore the, and uh, take out the, 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 the tasks in a, in a slower way. Absolutely, so you can of course do it through the rubric UI, you can use our plugin, you can use the API, right? Which oh, I'm like, yeah. API. Is, yeah. <laughs> um, but that's me personally. And if you don't believe me, Benjamin Franklin is also a gigantic fan of vCloud Director and Rubrik. Obviously, this is a made-up quote. We thought we'd have a little bit of fun. Um, and so it's really, what are you looking for, right? And you're able to create those custom-tailored uh, self-service options for your customers, right? So I'll wrap it up with, we're running low on time, so if you have questions, come see us, come swarm us afterwards, unfortunately. Um, you know, Stop by the Rubric booth. You can ask for me. My name's Rebecca. Raf will be around. Um, and of course, all the different ways that you can engage with us uh, online. I'll be wondering, so yeah. <laughs> stop me. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank you very much.